everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns channel and the Active Towns podcast. I'm John Zimmerman, and today I am absolutely delighted to have with me in the virtual studios, Avital Barnea. Avital, thank you so much for joining me in the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much, John. It's my pleasure to be here. So you are the Deputy Secretary for Transportation Planning at the California State Transportation Agency. And you also serve as the equity manager, providing leadership on equity issues across the agency's uh, eight (laughs) different departments and boards. And uh, you actually sent me a a really cool uh, graphic that has the the different agencies and boards. And I hadn't even realized this. Now, I'm I'm a native Californian, so I'm originally from the Los Angeles area, but then I grew up in uh, Northern California and my mom lived is right there in the Sacramento area in Rancho Cordova. So oh. here's the different eight different agencies. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're talking about the the Department of Transport or the Department of Motor Vehicles, the the Board of Pilot Commissioners, the you know Caltrans, all these different groups. So um, yeah, you, you you're busy. <laughs> we are busy. Yeah, as you can see there, the eight different boards, departments, commissions, overseeing all the different transportation facets of the state. It's about 40,000 employees. Um, We have kind of a unique setup here in California. I'm not sure that any other state has kind of the same umbrella organization that we do with the transportation agency overseeing all these different transportation departments. So we have our hands in everything from law enforcement with the highway patrol to licensing and registration with the DMV to building highways and high-speed rail and overseeing traffic safety and new cars and uh, funding and ship pilots. So it really spans the gamut of transportation. That's very interesting too, that you mentioned that. And I was, I was glad to see that the new uh, motor vehicle uh, board was also on there because when we really think about uh, what is necessary for uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the motor vehicle traffic safety issue. Um, I'm a firm believer of going upstream <laughs> to the root causes of a lot of things. And so uh, it, it's, it, it's imperative that we understand not only how things are planned and built the way they are, but then also, you know, kind of going up and looking at uh, some of these other factors that are involved. And so uh, obviously one of the things that we're quite sensitive to right now with the high rate of pedestrian pedestrian fatalities is the fact that our motor vehicle sizes over here in North America just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so um, it's, it's wonderful to see an agency uh, such as yours that also includes some of that, that new, you know, motor vehicle board sort of information and hopefully be able to influence some of the, on the manufacturing side too. So, uh, Yeah, Yeah, definitely. And actually, our Office of Traffic Safety and the Highway Patrol are going to be doing a safety blitz in September of this year, talking about focusing on pedestrian and bicyclist safety. You know, we talk about vulnerable road users, but the reason that they're vulnerable, bicyclists and pedestrians, is because of cars. And so, you know, really trying to focus on uh, the safety of drivers, the safety of vehicles, how can we make the entire system safe for everyone who's using it? Because I think we really have focused a lot on the safety of drivers and the people who are inside the automobile to the detriment of people who are outside of automobiles, biking and walking and, you know, not causing wear and tear on our system or, you know, creating uh, impacts to climate change through their their travel. And so that's something that we're very much focused on. Yeah, yeah. So you have undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Minnesota. Go, 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 Golden Ooh. Gophers. Uh, I'm, I, I did my graduate work at, at uh, just down the road there at uh, in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. So uh, a Wolverine on the graduate school side. Uh, but you also spent a little bit of time up in uh, one of my favorite areas, uh, which is uh, Colorado. Uh, you were over in northern Colorado a little bit. What were you doing there? I did. So uh, before I got into transportation, I was a music major. So I was living in Colorado, going to the University of Northern Colorado, studying oboe performance. And I still play oboe. It's a great hobby of mine. I decided, you know, it's not what I wanted it to be for my career. But um, yeah, I was living in Northern Colorado, which for folks who haven't been there, it's maybe more cows than people. It's pretty flat and brown. It's not, you know, (laughs) you think of mountainous, Rocky Mountain National Park. It's 
it's more sort of like an extension of Kansas in terms of geography, but you yeah. know, nice people, um, fun place to live and yeah, a different chapter of my life. Yeah, we used to joke because I was in Boulder. And so if the winds were just right, we could actually smell uh, the cattle in some of the feedlots there in, in the Greeley area. So <laughs> totally. Yep, sure. So I, as I mentioned, I, I sort of stole your thunder a little bit in, in terms of uh, that introduction. Uh, but let's let's have you fill in the gap. Uh, you know, after you finished your, your graduate degree, you know, I, I, I know that you, you made that move and this is part of your story. So you made the move from Minnesota to DC. So why don't you go ahead and fill in the gap there? Yeah. Um, so my uh, second year of graduate school, second year of my master's, I was accepted into the Presidential Management Fellowship, which is a fellowship program for recent uh, graduate students. And it's basically like a pathway for, for young people to work for the federal government, or not, not necessarily young people, but, but, but recent graduate students. Um, it can be quite difficult to get a job with the federal government. You know, if you don't have experience, if you don't have that network, if you haven't served in the military or the Peace Corps or have these other kinds of qualifiers that might push you to the top of the list, it can be quite difficult to work for the federal government early on in your career. So the Presidential Management Fellowship gives sort of a boost to these uh, these recent graduate students to give them a door to working for federal service. And so I was accepted into this program. I moved to Washington, D.C. to work for the Federal Transit Administration. Um, the first part of my work there was working on the Capital Investment Grant Program, which is a discretionary funding program for um, major transit capital investments across the country. And um, then I switched to working to metropolitan and statewide planning at the Federal Transit Administration. And also on behalf of the fellowship program, I went to work for the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance. Um, I grew up on, in Montana. And at that time, Senator Baucus from Montana was the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. And they were working on the surface transportation reauthorization at that time, MAP 21, which is what authorizes all of the federal transportation programs. And they said, hey, you're from Montana, you know transportation, we're working on this bill, you know, we'd love to have you come spend some time with us. And so I did a rotation over there with the Senate Finance Committee. Um, I was there when the bill was signed, it was really exciting. And uh, then came back and went to work in the office of the secretary on some other discretionary grant programs, including uh, what was then known as Tiger, um, now it's known as RAISE, um, the Infra program, which funds freight projects, and uh, continuing to work on transit policy. Um, and then I finished up my stint in Washington, D.C., working for AASHTO, which is the member association that represents all of the state departments of transportation. And I actually switched from being transit focused, which I had been for about the first eight years or so of my career, to managing their freight program. And so instead of moving people, moving goods and things. And so that was interesting to uh, sort of dip my toe into the other side of transportation there with freight. Wow. Wow. And then the opportunity to, to, to make the move to, to California. Right. Yeah. Um, I hadn't been at Ashto very long. I wasn't planning to leave my job there. I wasn't planning to leave D.C. And. Uh, someone I had worked with in Washington, D.C., David Kim. Um, he was an Obama appointee in the uh, Obama administration at USDOT. Um, he was the deputy administrator of the Federal Highway Administration. He was tapped to become the secretary of the California State Transportation Agency. And that provided a pathway for me to, to come with David out to Sacramento, um, become the deputy secretary for transportation planning here. Uh, so I was appointed by Governor Newsom in 2019 and made the move all the way across the country from uh, the capital of our nation to the capital of California. Um, you know, both government towns, I would say, you know, a lot of folks that work for the state or, or the government um, or affiliated with that in some way. Um, but yeah, just, you know, it's been really great. I loved my time in DC, uh, but I really like it here in Sacramento too. And we're doing some really amazing things here in California, you know, fifth largest economy in the world most complex transportation system in the nation. So there's a lot going on. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, so wh whereabouts in Montana? So I grew up in Billings, Montana. Okay, uh, Billings. So yeah. I have lived in every time zone in the contiguous U.S. now. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, uh, my uh, my parents ended up in Billings a couple of years before I was born. My okay. dad was the uh, conductor of the Billings Montana Symphony, and so that's oh, how we ended okay. up there. So yeah, yeah, lived there through high school and uh, have you know moved around since. Yeah. So it's it's rather interesting. Uh, you you buried the lead a little bit there in terms of uh, of part of the reason why um, we've brought you here today, <laughs> and that is uh, part of your story was that you uh, in making that move from Minnesota to to DC, you gave up a certain transportation device. What is it you gave up? I did. I gave up my car. I have oh lived gosh. without a car for about 11 or 12 years now. Yeah. 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 So growing up in Montana, you know, wide open spaces. Um, if you don't drive, you don't really go anywhere. And it's right. not atypical for people to drive several hours for shopping or to go to school so I was really coming from that driving mentality and, and not a lot of other options. In Minnesota, you know, similar, definitely more of a transit network, especially in the Twin Cities, mm -hmm. light rail, bus, um, bus rapid transit, commuter rail, but, um, you know, not a huge car-free culture there. And then I moved to D.C. and I'd always wanted to live somewhere without a car. Um you know, D.C. has an amazing public transportation network, very walkable, one of the top biking cities in the country, believe it or not. I don't know if a lot of people know that. And uh, so I, you know, really wanted to give up my car. And I think, uh, you know, part of that impetus was I had spent the summer after college living in Berlin, Germany. Uh -huh. And yeah, I was teaching English to, to fourth graders. So that was my reason for being there. But I realized that just having such an amazing transportation network that Berlin has, so many different kinds of rail and bus, streetcars, very bikeable, very walkable, you know, such high frequencies of their transit network and such a comprehensive system, you could really go anywhere very easily. And it created this sense of freedom. And, and the kids that I was teaching, we would take transit to go on field trips. And I remember it was my first or second day and the head teacher led us all out of the classroom and down the street to the Ubon station. And we all stood on the platform. And I was thinking to myself, like these kids, like half of them are going to fall on the tracks and we're going to get on the train and we're going to get off and half of them aren't going to get off. And this is going to be a disaster. And we all got there and the kids all knew how to take transit. And, you know, these are 10 year olds right. that are very comfortable taking this system. And it really did provide freedom and mobility for young people and for you know anyone who doesn't want to drive, can't drive because of their age or their ability or their financial situation or whatever that reason may be. So that really opened my eyes. So I did get rid of my car when I moved to DC and haven't looked back since. Um, recently, I you know I don't know how many, how many of your viewers are on Facebook, but you uh, get these memories from several years ago on this day that yeah. didn't happen. I just had a memory that was like 10 years ago. And it was like the number of days I've missed having a car in DC, zero. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was my memory from, you know, a decade ago. Yeah. Um, and I, then I decided when I moved to California, you know, I'm going to try it without a car. Yeah. Sacramento also has a fairly decent public transportation system. Um, there's light rail, there's bus. Um, where I live in the Midtown area is very walkable. It's a grid system. Um, yeah. It's flat. There's bike lanes everywhere. And so I've successfully lived here without a car for three years. Yeah. It's uh, in fact, if I were to, to criticize the, the Sacramento area, um, you know, in terms of like uh, accessibility and from a transit perspective, it would probably be uh, the, the lack of a, a light rail system out to the airport. Um, to be able to easily get out to the airport, um, you know, and you know, comfortably is is a huge challenge, and, and I think that's you know that's you know one of the the, the major uh, things that is missing. There there's several, but that's one of the major things, and I, I know that because I, I'll fly back there to visit my mom, who's you know who lives in the area there, and uh, uh, if 
if there was rail or, you know, that sort of service, transit service, you know, very, very comfortable transit service, um, I could literally take the, the light rail uh, to a station near her, her place and, and walk from there to her house. <laughs> and so, and she used, she worked uh, for, and worked for many years and retired from the state agency, uh, working for the state of California as well. So she, uh, uh, that's how she would get to work too, uh, for many, many years was to, to get on the, 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 the light rail and go in and sometimes the bus. Nice. Yeah, nice. I, I take the light rail and I took it this morning. Yeah. Um, we do have bus service to the airport. Mm -hmm. um, there's one line operated by SAC RT, which is our transit provider here in Sacramento County. And then another one operated by Yolo bus, which is the transit provider in Yolo County, which is just next door. Mm -hmm. Um, they're both like one time an hour, so not, you know, super yeah. high frequencies. Right. And when you're catching a flight, you know, yeah. you know, you, you can't necessarily make that uh, risk of yeah. only having one bus an hour. So, yeah. you know, it could be better in some ways. I know that that these transit agencies and many across the country are facing labor shortages right. right now. And so that's, you know, part of the reason that the frequencies aren't as high. But yeah, yeah. Uh, more transit service, I think, would be great. Yeah. And that's the same thing that we're, we're, we're suffering from that same sort of lack of vision from from a, a rail transit uh um, facilities here in Austin, Texas, too. I mean, we've got one transit line that, that heads, you know, sort of north and then it angles its way uh, east and then cuts its way across to the west. Uh, but again, nothing out to the airport. And, and so that's now in the works, in the planning. Um, the voters have passed uh, the bond, <laughs> your, your fun light. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. Sorry to your viewers. My light keeps flickering on and off. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, and, and so that it, it's it, what was nice about uh, the case here in Austin is that the voters saw that this was something that was incredibly important to do. And so as part of uh, two, a two-pronged bond package that went to the voters here, um, a Proposition A at the time was uh, Project Connect, which was transit and being able to invest in expanding uh, the rail options and, and also the, the bus rapid transit and other bus options. And then the second uh, a bond of, of that particular um, uh, year, that was 2020, was um, uh, Proposition B, which was basically $720 million for active transportation and uh, safety and Vision Zero um, activities you know, for the city. So it was wonderful to see that the the voters uh, understand that this is stuff that we have to, you know, we have to pay for it. We have to, we have to, you know, vote for it and, and, uh, and, and basically sends a clear message to uh, the politicians, <laughs> the leadership, uh, that this is something that we're willing to invest in. And uh, I get the sense that that's kind of the state that California is in now as well, um, is you're hearing from your constituents that we need to do, we need to do something. We need to do something about, um, you know, climate change. We need to do something about our, our transportation systems. And um, I'll just kind of tee that up a little bit and, and, and have you sort of reflect upon uh, the realities that you've kind of stepped into in, in 2019. And, uh, and obviously you had the pandemic as, as part of your, your tenure, a good portion of your tenure, uh, but, but reflect a, a little bit upon, you know, the challenges that California is facing right now. Yeah, so California is definitely seeing the impacts of climate change. Uh, right now, we have several active wildfires burning in the state. It was 116 degrees in Sacramento last week. It made national news. Um, that was a record. And several records were broken for heat this year, with the previous record having been set last year. And so these are really the impacts of climate change. It's getting hotter in the summers. We're having more extreme weather. Yep, you see the fires here rock slides, mud slides. Here's Highway 1 on the California coast that was washed out here from a mud slide. Um, we have a rail line near the San Diego area, the Del Mar Bluffs, that um, is eroding. And uh, oh yeah, here you see flooding also on our, our highway system. That's another one of the impacts we're seeing from climate change. Um, but yeah, there's this rail line also that's about to fall into the ocean. And um, we're providing some funding 
to move that inland. And that is a major infrastructure project. And so, you know, definitely coming in here to California, yep, here's the, the Del Mar Bluffs rail line. You can see right there how close that is to falling into the ocean. Yeah. It's a beautiful view when you're on that train, but it's a little it's, precarious. You it's know? actually one um, of my favorite surf spots. I, I yeah. spent many, many years surfing in, in that particular uh, spot there when I lived in Southern California. Wow. And, uh, and I know those bluffs quite well. And so when I saw this photo, I was just, I, I had heard about it, but I hadn't seen the visual until you, you sent me this photo and I'm like, Oh wow. Yeah. They really, you, you're gonna have to, to move that. And, and I think that that, uh, this along with the other photo of, you know, of highway one, and, and this isn't new, I mean, high in, in, in the decades, uh, you know, Previous to this, I mean, we we've had washouts on Highway One before, and but you know this bluff, you know, <laughs> basically being undermined to this extent really sort of exemplifies the sense of urgency that I think we all should be moving for forward in terms of trying to battle uh, a, a new reality in terms of our climate. Yeah, definitely, and in California has been built around the automobile. And so, so much of our transportation system is focused on that. But in order to mitigate the impacts of climate change, we know that we need to reduce our our driving basically and go to cleaner modes of transportation. Yeah, this photo here, this is a postcard, I think from the 1960s, if I had to guess, yeah. um, you know, that someone would send to someone to say, wow, this is what Los yeah. Angeles is all about. Man, I take those <laughs> crazy Los Angeles freeways, like, just look at this spider web of roads. Um, but you were mentioning in Austin, some of these bond measures that the taxpayers have voted on. Yeah. Uh, so we have a lot of self-help counties in California that have also voted to tax themselves to um, make these transportation improvements. We also have a lot of areas that don't have the resources that are, are lower income that aren't able to pass these self-help measures. Um, but we have a lot of resources in the state Two, we passed Senate Bill 1 several years ago that uh, is a, a fee on vehicle registration and some other um, money coming into the transportation system to support our, our multimodal transportation network. I remember when I took this job, a friend of mine said, you know, there's a lot going on in California, but the best thing is there's money. Right. You know, there's vision. It's progressive. It's We're trying to move away from this very man dig those crazy Los Angeles freeways model yeah. um, to something more multimodal. And and I want to be clear to, you know, we're not trying to take away anyone's car. Uh, the automobile is so ingrained in California and in our nation, in our world. I mean, people drive in every country on this nation. And so that's not something that is going to go away. Um, but we want to give people options. Not everyone wants to drive. Not everybody can drive. As I mentioned, transportation is a huge contributor to climate change. It's actually the top single source contributor in the state of California to climate change. And in addition to those impacts, you know, there's noise pollution, there's brake dust, tire dust. Even if we go to a completely zero emission vehicles, there's still going to be impacts from having a very auto-centric transportation system. And so that's what we're trying to do is to move beyond that, to support a more multimodal system where if some folks wanna drive, be my guest, you can drive. But if some folks want to take transit or walk or bike or scoot or however they might want to get somewhere, um, you know, we want to make that safe and comfortable and convenient. And so that's what we're trying to invest in here. And you can see this chart here, how transportation, this is even from a couple years ago, I believe this number has gone up. So in 2019, transportation contributed 41% of greenhouse gas emissions. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a huge sector. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at the challenge that we have in, in front of us there in, in California that you have in front of you, um, what are some of the the things that are the, the biggest barriers to overcome uh, to be able to to basically address this and, and, and start turning the tide? Well, I think land use is a huge barrier. Um, California is very spread out. It's a huge state, but we have a lot of low density land uses. And until just about a year ago, it was actually illegal in most places across the state to build multifamily housing. So now there was a law passed that 
there has to be, um, you know, that you have to be able to build multiple family units on single family lots. And so that'll allow us to have greater density. And so people can live closer to where they work, hopefully, they'll create more opportunities for housing, hopefully bring down the cost of housing. Um, I see this tweet here. I don't know who Sam is, but I, I resonate with his tweet <laughs> that, that people should be less mad about gas prices and more mad that they can't live in their cities without relying on cars. Um, I don't know yeah. who Sam is either, but I'm with you, it, buddy. <laughs> I know, I'm very insightful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about this message, um, you know, but a lot of folks don't have the option but to drive. And yeah a part of that is because of that land use. And we've seen it become so expensive to live in city centers that a lot of people are pushed out to the periphery because that's where they can afford to live. And then they're forced to drive many miles. Uh, you know, coming from Montana, if you told me that it would take you an hour to drive six miles, which it definitely can in parts of California, that, that would have blown my mind. But that's, you know, the reality here. And so yeah. we really need to come up with other solutions. Um, I think another barrier is that uh, folks just don't understand what their options are. You know, we have a, the Department of Motor Vehicle. We oversee it here at, at CalSTA um, and we teach people how to drive and we license people how to, uh, to drive. But there's no agency or entity that's teaching people how to take transit, how to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. That was something else when I was in Berlin, the students were learning how to ride a bike at school. Right. And there was an obstacle course set up in the parking lot and they learned how to signal and how to brake and how to, you know, uh, change a tire and all that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's just not an option for people because they don't know that it's an option. You see yeah. here, this is, uh, I went to Copenhagen, Denmark this summer, and this is outside the main train station. And I forget the number, but it's a significant number of people access this train station by bike. Yeah. You can see all of the bikes here. It is really just, a, you know, one, probably the number one or number two biking city in the world. It was really amazing to be there and see that. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, I, I'm unfamiliar with the, the Denmark statistics, but the, the statistics from the, the Netherlands is approximately 40 percent of all train journeys have people arriving to and then uh, or, and or leaving the train station, um, the transit stops uh, by bike and uh, and the the transit agency there in the Netherlands also runs the uh, they have their own bike share uh, system too so that when you if you ride your personal bike to a transit stop get on the train go into say Amsterdam or Utrecht or wherever uh, get off then you can check out you know a, a bike for the day that is your bike to use for the day for you know your meetings and whatever uh, trips that you have and then you know and then return to the transit station head back home. Etc. Uh, but I would not be surprised if it's right around 40% uh, there in, in Denmark as well. Yeah, I, I would imagine it's a similar statistic. Yeah, the hotel that we stayed in in Denmark had free bikes, and that was the best way to get around. You know, that's just what folks do there. And it's not so much the culture in the United States. Yeah, here's this is a bicycle and pedestrian only bridge in Denmark. Um, so you can see, you know, this was like middle of the day on a weekday. Look how many people are biking over this bridge. So yeah. that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And what I love about the bicycle as a viable solution for, for North America is that because of the built environment, um, our distances in many cities, especially Western cities, um, our distances are much greater than what we would typically see in, say, you know, D.C. or Philadelphia, some of the older cities that have a form factor, which was built, you know, way before the invention of the automobile. And so uh, the, inherently, if you've got transit in those areas, those trips, those destinations that you're meaningful destinations you're trying to get to are, are most often within easy walking distance. Um, but as we head west, <laughs> word, uh, you know, these cities are almost all been developed, um, you know, on a, a form factor of the automobile. Um, but even though, even though that is the case, we still know that about 40 to 50 percent in most 
Western cities of those trips are easily bikeable distances. And what I mean by that is, you know, somewhere in that three to six mile distance, if you take draw a circle around Sacramento of, of where that would take you, it's pretty impressive the amount of uh, distance. And now with the electric assist technology for bicycles, uh, who knows? I mean, I'm starting to hear people saying, yeah, no, comfortably I can ride into work, not be sweaty, you know, and I'm, I'm coming, you know, six and a half to seven miles. And so it's like, oh yeah, there, yeah. the game is changing. And, and I think that from, that's part of the magic, I think of the, the Dutch system is the fact that their cycle network is so well built out that you have that ninefold increase of your catchment area for every single transit stop compared to if it's walk you know walking only. Yeah, I was going to mention. I think e-bikes really are a game changer. You know, I've heard folks say, you know, I would love to bike to work, but I don't want to show up to work sweaty. We don't have showers at work, or I don't have time to take a shower at work. Like I totally get that. And you know, with the e-bike, it does allow you that mobility without having to exert so much effort that you would if you were just on a regular, you know, manual powered bicycle. Um, you know, I want to mention that I know that not everyone has the ability to bike or the interest to bike. You know, um, you need to be able-bodied to, to bike, and so we know it's not an option for everybody. But again, we want to have options for the whole span of folks who are interested in taking different modes of transportation. And so, you know, bikes are a viable option for other segments of the population. And we want to make sure that there are safe and convenient places for people to, to bike, protected bike lanes, bike infrastructure. Um, I love bike sharing programs. We have one here in Sacramento. Um, so I do really think that that is something that can be a game changer and really can um, like you mentioned, you know, be a first last mile solution for transit that can really open up the network and create, make it so much easier for people to be able to uh, to take transit if they have a bike for that first or last mile. Yeah. And uh, I, I like to remind people, too, that um, don't make the assumption that um, that, you know, people with disabilities are, are not able to use the, the cycle networks. If you have a, a, a truly safe and inviting cycle network, it is in fact a mobility um, enhancing facility for, for people who may not be able-bodied. So we have to re we have to sort of rejigger what our perception is when we when we think of what cycling infrastructure is is used for and who uses it because it's it, in fact for many people it's the most enabling <laughs> uh, infrastructure that can be in, in place out there and uh, as as we saw in that video um, that I recently uh, post out on LinkedIn uh, you know it, it was a mobility you know facility for somebody in a mobility device and if if you didn't notice this person was not only in a wheelchair but was also blind too so it was mm -hmm. it was a double <laughs> double whammy for for this person in that sense of uh talk about the empowerment level of feeling like they have a truly safe and inviting uh network of facilities to be able to to partake in and we're we're, we're working on this so we're trying to transform our built environment that we have, you know, from this car centric design, and we're starting to carve out space uh, and, and trying to, you know, be able to empower more people uh, to truly feel like there's a safe and inviting uh, facility, a safe and inviting network um, to be able to meet our daily needs get to me get to meaningful destinations and so this is a wonderful example that you sent to us uh i believe this is in the the downtown sacramento area isn't that correct that's right yeah this is sort of the edge between the downtown and midtown neighborhoods you see the protected bike lane here the sign you know it says bikes on the left parking on the right so the bikes are protected here by the cars you see that green paint on the pavement that's where the intersection is to sort of alert motorists like this is a bike lane. Um, so this is a very comfortable place to bike. There's a sidewalk here on the left. So I, you know, I would call this a complete street. And I will give out a shout out to my former colleague, Barbara McCann of the Federal Highway Administration who coined the term yeah, yeah. complete streets. And it is an industry term now. She wrote a book called Completing Our Streets. And I think this is a really fabulous example. You see the shade trees here. Sacramento is the city of trees. Um, you see how flat it is. You know, I just think this is a really good example of some of the investments that can be made to have really great cycling infrastructure in the city. Yeah, 
Yeah. And this is a really good example of a, a, a much better approach towards a complete street. Um, too often I'm seeing cities that are building complete streets that are complete disasters. You know, it's like, oh, hey, we've got a sidewalk. Oh, hey, we've got a bike lane. Oh, yeah. But it's right next to, you know, motor vehicle traffic that's traveling at speeds where you wouldn't feel comfortable out there. I wouldn't feel comfortable out there. Most certainly, you know, a, an eight year old or an 80 year old probably wouldn't feel comfortable either walking or biking along that. Um, and, you know, not a tree in sight. <laughs> so uh, yeah. this is a wonderful example of what we mean when we say, hey, it's not complete. Um, if it's not truly inviting and truly uh, safe, you know, for folks, and if, if it's not, you know, hopefully it's tree covered, you know, hopefully it's it, it's truly a beautiful environment too. I think somebody coined the term is it's not complete until it's beautiful, or it's not complete hmm. until it's comfortable. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and this is such a good example, but there are a lot of really bad examples too in California yeah. and everywhere. Um, you know, that aren't complete streets that are multiple lanes wide, no sidewalk, really not possible or safe for someone to travel on that street unless they're in a vehicle. And so, you know, we want to work on things that look more like this. We realize that's not possible everywhere. You know, context sensitive solutions is a term that we use in the industry to to uh, to have the right solution for that facility. And, and I know complete streets also has flexibility in its definition based on what the transportation facility is, what makes sense. Um, but this this street here, you know, is very inviting for basically anyone on any kind of mode of transportation. Yeah, and I'm zooming in on on a different view of this same street to, to, to get to the sign here uh, to point out that, oh yes, to, to channel my good friend Don Shoup, uh, who wrote the book, The High Cost of Free Parking, uh, this is, you know, we're, we're pricing the, the, the parking along this corridor too, so that we make sure that, uh, that that we are, you know, getting that benefit and we are getting turnover of, of, of parking in, in this particular area. So these are, these are again strategies that uh, that cities, you know, hopefully feel increasingly empowered from their voter base, from their constituents to move forward on, because these are all the little incremental things that have to take place, and I would say they have to take start taking place more quickly with a little bit more of a sense of urgency, given the level of uh, of challenge that we have in front of us. Um, what have we not mentioned that uh, that you want to make sure that we uh, share with our audience today? Hmm. Let's I see. know what I want to ask you, but I want to give yeah. it. I want to serve this up to you for a bit. Yeah. Um, gosh. Well, I think, you know, something I want to be clear. I know I've talked a lot about that I live car free. Um, and it's really opened my eyes about what that is like, especially in California to live car free. But I want to mention that I live car free by choice. And if I wanted to have a car, I could afford to have a car, but I really don't want to. You know, I found that my life is simpler and easier if I don't have a car. But but there are a lot of folks that don't have a car and it's not their choice. Right. And, you know, I want to make a distinction between what we you know call choice users and captive users. You know, we can argue whether those are appropriate terms or not. Um, but I, I do want to mention that I am coming at this from a point of privilege. But I also think that it's important as someone who is working on the statewide level um, for transportation planning for the entire state of California that I have this eye into what it is like to really use the full spectrum of our transportation network. I'm using every single mode that we have basically. Um, and, you know, not trying to, to knock any of my colleagues, but I, I know that I, w- I work with people that have probably never ridden a bike, never taken transit, you know? And so I, I do think that it's important to understand and be a user of these systems in order to plan and implement them effectively. But I also, you know, want to be clear that I am doing that from a position of some privilege and, and it is my choice, but uh, yeah, very much experiencing what it's like when the bus doesn't come and it's yep. hundred degrees outside and there's no shelter, you know, or the sidewalk just ends. Um, yeah. I think I had a picture in there. It was a little cartoon of um, some, some vehicles driving down the street. Uh, yeah. So it says, uh, the road lane ends again. I hate sharing tracks with the train. 
Yeah. So like this is absurd, <laughs> right? Like we wouldn't expect all of a sudden the road to just end and now the cars need to drive on the railroad tracks with the train. Yeah. But this is what it's like when this the sidewalk like. ends yeah. or the bike lane ends or there's no sidewalk or no bike lane or no way to get there unless you're in a vehicle. And uh, so, you know, I thought that this was funny, yeah. but, you know, true. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Steve Patrick Adams uh, dot com on that. Uh, uh, nice little little snarky comic there. It's like, no, as drivers, we would not tolerate that. I mean, we, we you know, drivers would be incensed if if all of a sudden their lane just completely ended. And oh, by the way, yeah, you're going to have to share the tracks with the train. Right. Good right. Luck. It wouldn't be safe. Good luck. You know, and, it's, yeah. you know, when we put bikes and pedestrians in the same path of travel with yeah. with cars, it's not safe either. So. Yeah. yeah. So my question for you is, is a little more personal in nature in, in terms of uh, of making that move, you know, from D.C. In, into Sacramento. And, you know, you had the courage to say, yeah, I, I want to continue this. I want to be able to continue my car free lifestyle. Um, just to reflect. What was that like? Yeah. Um, you know, just. California is known as being so auto centric. It's part of the movie industry, like that postcard that we showed, like people just affiliate California and the automobile. So that was part of my thinking too. You know, I thought there is really an opportunity moving here, working on the transportation system in California to try to make it more multimodal, living here without a car in California. You know, I didn't know how long I would be able to do that if it would be successful. So far, so good. Um, you know, and I just love educating people on what their options are. Um, I had my orchestra rehearsal last night. As I mentioned, I still play oboe and we just moved to a new venue and I had been carpooling with somebody because our old rehearsal space wasn't anywhere I could get on transit. And I told her, hey, you know, we can take the bus or the light rail to this rehearsal. And uh, she, she sort of said, you know, I'm so tired at the end of the day. The last thing I want to do is take the train. But at the same time, she was saying, oh, parking is crazy. We have to get there so early. And I'm like, you know, you don't have to worry about that if you take transit. So I think my goal <laughs> might be to be like, hey, why don't we try to take transit sometime to rehearsal? Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to, to let people know about their options, you know, and I'm only one person and there are 40 million people in California. So that's not necessarily the most effective strategy. But I feel like, you know, every opportunity I have to sort of be an ambassador of our entire transportation system yeah. and and break that stigma of who takes the bus or who bikes. You know, I'm in my office attire today. I'm wearing a dress. I will go out on a scooter, perhaps at lunch, and go get right. some lunch. And I'm sort of hoping that people see me and say, wow, yep. that's, you know, a professional woman on a scooter. Like, that's not yeah. the kind of person I would think to see riding yeah. riding an, an e-scooter yeah. or taking the light rail like I did this morning. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think for a lot of folks that don't use these transportation systems, they have some sort of idea in their mind of, like, who takes transit or you know who uses these shared mobility services and i'm sort of trying in my own way to, to change that perception yeah i'm going to go back to th this photo uh from copenhagen because i one of the great things that i love about uh visiting copenhagen as well as visiting um uh, the, the Netherlands, cities in the Netherlands, uh, visiting Paris increasingly these days, is that you see people riding to their destinations, um, just their everyday destinations. Uh, th this, this particular lady in the in center frame is, is in a, a nice sundress here. Um, and so you, you mentioned that you, there's not much that you can do as a single person, but I, I disagree. I mean, you are an active living, active mobility advocate. Um, you're an ambassador of, of, of this. And so you're absolutely right. You jump on the scooter or you jump on a, an electric assist bike share bike. Um, people see that. And, uh, and, and I try to reinforce that, you know, from a human behavior per perspective, we're still a herding species. We still see, you know, what's going on around us. And when we see somebody who is like having a good time, <laughs> enjoying themselves, wearing normal work clothes and going about their, 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 
their business, you know, getting from place to place using transit, using uh, mobility devices, and 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 hopefully doing some so with a smile on her face because she is enjoying herself. Uh, it, it it does. It, it's there's a ripple effect, and and I applaud you for also you know having the courage to to help your your friend and fellow uh, musician to be able to say we can do this come on (laughs) because that's the type of support and and what i love about this is this is how movements start this is how we are or able to to start changing the narrative this is how even like in in the city here in austin that how that momentum started to change with the voters to being able to say that you know hey we're going to hold you the, the the elected officials accountable this is the vision that we have for our city is that we will be more walkable and bikeable in the future and we need to invest in this um and so I do believe that from a, um, a from a behavior standpoint and from a momentum building perspective, uh, the little things that we do every single day, going out there, being conspicuous about, you know, it, it's one of the reasons why I always ride my bike to the grocery store in my normal clothes without my helmet. Mm-hmm. I want to normalize this activity. I don't want it to, to seem like it's a dangerous activity. I'm privileged and fortunate enough to have a safe route from my home to the grocery store. So I feel comfortable doing that. But it sends a very subtle message that I think helps to create what I call a culture of activity for our communities. So definitely, definitely. That reminds me of another image that I sent you, which is a painting by Gustave Calibot of uh, people in Paris in the rain. It's from the 1800s. I love yep. this painting. Um, and uh, someone superimposed orange and yellow safety vests yeah. on, on these people. Yeah. And yeah, the caption was something like, oh yeah, there it is, pedestrians staying visible so they aren't killed by cars, Paris yeah. 1877. Yeah. I mean, it's tongue in cheek, there weren't cars in Paris in 1877. <laughs> exactly. but, but like you were saying, you know, yeah. not wearing a helmet, yeah. like the reason that, that pedestrians and bicyclists are vulnerable road users is yeah. because of cars. It's yeah. not, you know, it has happened that a pedestrian or that a bicyclist has hit a pedestrian and killed them. That does happen, but it's very rare. Yeah. And so like that, you know, orange safety vest thing, it's yeah. like kind of ridiculous that you put the, the burden and the onus of safety on the person that has the least, you know, I, I guess responsibility, I would say for, for, um, being the, you know, yeah. the safe user of that system. Um, I wanted to mention too, I really feel like um, we're seeing with young people um, more of an impetus to, to use multimodal options. I think part of that is the cell phone and young people don't necessarily want to be behind the wheel because then they can't be on their phone, at least not safely. Right. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Reddit. I don't know if you use Reddit, but... Uh, I haven't, no, I haven't okay. gotten into Reddit. Okay, so this is the it's third nice, time yeah. that this has come up. I'm, I may okay. have to start getting in there, so, but yes, yeah. go ahead. So there are these different groups that are called subreddits. Yeah. One of them is, is called Suburban Hell. That's what yeah. it's called. But I see a lot of kids posting and saying, I don't like living here in the suburbs. I can't get anywhere. I can't wait to move to a city where it's walkable and bikeable. Um, I should have sent you this this meme, and I didn't, but it says kids don't go outside anymore. And then below it, it says the outside they built, and it's like a six-lane strode. I think right. your, your viewership probably knows what a strode is, yeah. you know, with strip malls and no sidewalk. And it's like, okay, well, if, you know, that's what, what kids are living in, like, that's really not inviting or safe for them to go outside. And so I'm hopeful that the next generation will help us with this push to be more multimodal and be more open to it and open to their options. And um, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. I, I would say that the, the statistics are bearing out that uh, both the millennial generation, generation Z, um, uh, both are, um, you know, getting driver's license at a much lower rate than uh, previous uh, generations. And um, it, it's possible that wh- whoever, whatever the next generation beyond that is going to be, it, it's probably going to be the same. Um, there is that pressure uh, for, you know, having authentic places where they can, you know, be able to meet their daily needs, not by being tied to um, car dependency and the financial burdens that come along with that. 
Uh, and this kind of touches on the fact that, you know, being able, you had mentioned, you know, the privilege of being able to be in a situation where you're able to uh, live close enough to be able to, to get to work and, you know, through transit and, and other means. Um, it, that's what we're experiencing here in, in Austin. I mean, we were fortunate and privileged enough to be able to purchase a home where I can ride my bike to the grocery store. I can ride or walk to downtown. Um but it's incredibly expensive. So many people are not able to afford that. And um, and you had mentioned it, that, you know, you're car free by choice, not by necessity or by circumstance. And uh, and I think that that's one of the, the, the biggest challenges I, that I think we have as a society is to be able to say, hey, we need to be able to build more housing, more legitimate places and, you know, have have them in, in, in an area or in a land use pattern so that we can encourage more people to be able to access, uh, you know, high quality transit, being able to walk and bike to be able to meet their, our daily needs. So it's not as simple as just the pipes. If you look at roads as pipes, <laughs> the transportation systems and all of that, it's it really is what we've done around us. And so it starts to bleed into, uh, you know, land use philosophies and, and things of that nature, too. Right. Yeah. And more and more in my career, I've really started to see land use as the horse and transportation as the cart. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we do have such sprawling land use here in California that it, you know, creates these very long trips that people have to have to make. And they make the trade off. They say, you know, yeah. I can't afford to live in the downtown area. Um, so I'm going to live really far away, but at least I'll have my car and I can drive those distances, you know, but that creates a lot of challenges in and of itself. Um, when I was in Europe over the summer, I was talking to someone and he said, you know what I heard? He said, I heard that in America, some people have cars, but they don't have houses. Right. And he said, I, you know, I, that, that blows my mind. And, you know, that's true. And we have a, a very large unhoused epidemic here in California. And I, I know that other places in the country are dealing with that as well. But there are a lot of people that live in their car that don't have a stable housing situation, but they have a car because the way our transportation system has been built, it's really difficult to get places in a lot of a lot of places unless you have a car, you know, unless you yeah. can't afford to live in these more dense multimodal urban centers. And so we're trying to invest in the entire system across the state so that you can have choices no matter where you live. You know, uh, Caltrans created a complete streets policy last year that's saying that any facility or every facility, excuse me, that Caltrans um, funds or oversees will provide comfortable, convenient and connected complete streets facilities for people walking, biking and taking transit or passenger rail. And so, you know, we're really saying that we have a very extensive 52,000 lane mile highway system and it's not appropriate in all of those places to have, you know, walking and biking facilities, but where, where it's feasible, we need to consider complete streets in all projects, you know, not just in these dense downtown urban areas. And, and you mentioned Caltrans and, and, and again, one of the graphics that you sent over is, is one of the Caltrans uh, graphics here that really kind of highlights uh <laughs> An admission right in right off the top is like, yeah, bigger roads means more traffic. Um, walk us through this graphic and this will sort of close us out for the day. Yeah, I think that this is really kind of incredible for a state DOT to have published something like this and being so forward about what adding vehicle lanes actually does. So this is the concept of induced demand. So you see here for years, governments try to tackle congestion by widening our roads. You know, there's traffic. People say we well, need more lanes. It's too many cars, too few lanes. We hear a lot of the time, you know, cars are just idling. That's creating more pollution, more emissions leading to climate change. If we just add more lanes, traffic will be free flowing. We'll reduce emissions. We'll reduce traffic congestion, travel times. Everyone will be happy. So that's kind of how. Uh, highway engineering has worked, you know, for the last 70, 50, 80 60, years. 70 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you add a lane and you keep adding, adding, adding lanes. 
but the traffic comes back. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the concept of induced demand that as you create more of something and it becomes like less rare, I guess, if you will, yeah. um, we'll start using it more. So maybe folks that were carpooling say, wow, there's no traffic. I don't need to carpool. I'm going to drive myself or folks that maybe took the bus. They say, wow, you know, I can drive my own car it's so much faster. It's so much more convenient or, you know, I wasn't going to take this trip at all, but now I'm going to, because it's very, uh, you know, it's a low barrier for me to get from A to B. And so this just attracts more and more people to the system and you end up having worse traffic than you had before. And so Caltrans created this this graphic, which I think is, is fun and explains this concept in an interesting way. And this is really to help them shift. Um, Senate Bill 743 is uh, requiring Caltrans now, instead of looking at what's called level of service, which is mm -hmm. basically how free flowing the traffic is when they're planning projects, now they have to look at the vehicle miles traveled that will be created and induced from a new project. And so they're looking at transportation solutions and analyzing projects based on how much, how many new vehicle trips and uh, vehicle miles traveled will be created, not necessarily how free flowing that system will be, but looking at it in this other way will lead to a more free flowing system because it will invest in other kinds of transportation for folks, other kinds of modes, different alternatives. And so that's what we're looking at here. And, you know, it's uh, not going to be a, a quick road, no pun intended, but right. I think it's one that's really important. And we're doing everything that we can here in California to uh, have a more multimodal, comprehensive, safe, convenient transportation system for all users. Yeah. And uh, I believe Colorado um, also uh, did something similar in the evaluation. I think that they had some assistance from the Rocky Mountain Institute and some other entities. Uh, transportation for America, I think, also was involved with that of, you know, looking at you know, a potential highway expansion and then looking at, okay, well, what's the induced demand impact going to be? And what's that impact on climate? And what's that impact on health? And uh, in realizing that, you know, no, it, it actually doesn't pencil out. And having lived through many <laughs> highway expansions, including the 405 down in Southern California, I can tell you that, um, Sometimes the return of of you know the time of of when you think you're going to get free free flowing uh, traffic is is incredibly short. It, like for instance, it may take three years to to do that highway expansion and add those lanes, and then you're just shocked to see that in 18 months you've got a new equilibrium and you know a gridlock once again. <laughs> so, that's exactly right yeah yeah, yeah. we've so seen that you lived it <laughs> so it's like wait a minute what was our return on investment for those billions of dollars yeah yep, about yep. 17 months of of free-flowing traffic yeah lovely <laughs> yeah so there's a better way yeah there's a better way <laughs> and you're living it <laughs> thank you so <laughs> much Avi tall for you know for joining me on the active towns podcast and sharing your story it's been such a pleasure meeting you thank you john this was great thanks so much for speaking with me i had a lot of fun thank you so much everyone for watching this episode with avital barnea deputy secretary of transportation planning for the california state transportation agency uh if you enjoyed it remember give it a thumbs up <laughs> leave a comment down below and uh, be sure to share it with a friend and if you haven't done so already i'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel uh, just click on the uh, subscription button down below and also ring the notifications bell to select your notification preferences uh, i'll have another episode out for you next week and uh, until then this is john signing off by wishing you much activity health and happiness cheers